to be uh, in the few last weeks. Since uh, last week, uh, we, it started to rain. The weather has changed now. This is a saltis, which is classic uh, end of the spring where we have a change of weather, but for a few days, we'll have a bit of rain, a bit of storm coming, coming in, which is fine. We need some water in the soil, so that's fine with us. Bloom is finished. And uh, so this is, um, this is a good tempo, I should say. This is an early year. We will uh, probably uh, uh, harvest uh, end of August, which is uh, now becomes the rule in Champagne. Uh, this is uh, another sign of climate change. And um, so this is, um, this is looking good, promising. Let's say promising, because as we say in Champagne, till it's not in the basket press, it's not done. So let's <laughs> wait to the last moment because anything can happen. We can have hail storms, we can have um, mildew, we can have, uh, uh, yeah, things can become a bit difficult, but we are, we are resilient. We know what it's all about. Great. So what does it mean to be a chef de cave? And what does it mean to be the chef de cave of Louis Roderer? Uh, it means a lot. It means a lot in the, in the Champagne tradition, the chef de cave in the old uh, 18th, 17th century houses. Uh, there are a few chef de cave, not many, eh? it must be less than 20 persons. Uh, I would say even less than 15 persons in Champagne to be chef de cave of such houses. Our job is, I've been, I've been with Roderer for 31 years, so this is my uh, 30, one, 31 year with a company to understand our history, our terroir, where we come from, our goal, our values. All that is very important to, to really uh, be able to take over from my predecessor, which I did 20 years ago, and, and get ready to give to the next, to the next chef de cave. So this is a long continuity of tradition. Uh, some people will say a chef de cave is uh, maybe the, the gatekeeper, you know, or the style keeper of the house. We are, we are maintaining the original vision of the founder, uh, why we are making our wines here and on these soils and not on other soils. It's a decision that has been made uh, some years ago, some uh, centuries ago, I should say. And we have to stick to this vision, which was clear on each house as a different vision. So you need to embody, to embody this vision, yet you have to innovate, you have to adapt, because the wines we are making today are not the wines we made 50 years or 100 years ago, of course, the test is not the same, the climate is not the same, uh, the consumer expectations are not the same. So the role of the chef de cave is to be, at the same time, the guardian of tradition of the house, of a style, but at the same time to be in a position to prepare the next chapter and prepare the next uh, step uh, going towards another direction or fine tuning the style and getting to, um, to, to keep modernity, to, to keep uh, innovation, to keep um, dynamism into the house. It's not an old lady, it's uh, it's, uh, it's, I know it's of course a long, um, we have a long history, but this history gives us a lot of creative power. And the chef de cave must have this creative power uh, day after day. Uh, and we should question ourselves and, and the question is always the same. What can we do to make a better job? What can we do to create the wine that would be better than the previous one. So that's as simple as this. But also being the chef de gave at Louis Roder means you have some additional responsibilities unlike your other colleagues where you have to travel the globe a little bit and uh, you're part of a, at least tasting teams and overall management of how many different wineries? We have, we have a, a winery in Portugal, uh, Portugal, Portugal, Bordeaux, with Pichon Contes, Portugal with Ramos Pinto, 
Château de Pays, of course, in, in Saint Estève as well, and Pauillac, Pichon Comtesse. We have Domenot in Provence. Uh, we have California with Rotter Estate. Uh, now, Mary Edwards, and tomorrow, uh, Diamond Creek, because we, as you know, we have developed Diamond Creek. So, um, it's um, the family has built uh, over the years uh, a collection of beautiful terroir all over the world. Um, a story, a love story of the family with a terroir for different reasons. Because it's beautiful, because it's a surprise, because the wines are amazing, or because it's been created and run by amazing people as well. Uh, friends of a long, of a long time friends, like it is what, like it was for Diamond Creek with, with the Bornstein family. Uh, long time friends, projects, visions they had, and try to, to go in the next step. And I'm lucky enough to be close to the family and responsible for, um, I would say, more um, uh, maintaining maintaining the spirit of all this beautiful team of winemakers. Uh, I'm not going to teach Nicolas Gumino to make uh, Poyac wines, of course, or, or Georges Rosas to make uh, port. Uh, I'm much, I, ca I cannot teach them anything, but I will make sure that they, they put the best effort to, and I'm, we get sure the family understands what they need to, to really achieve the best, the best wines possible. And this is my job. So it's a <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, it's, it's very interesting to, to know that. And the fact that, you know, most people think of the winemakers or in the chef de coves of champagne in a very certain light, you have this responsibility that goes beyond champagne and this collective of winemakers that you're working with on a regular basis that really creates a foundation for um, information and knowledge sharing, um, which I think we can see through what's happening at Champagne Louis Roterer, um, vast improvements, obviously from farming, from how to, how to treat a, uh, the dry wines, which are important yeah. to make the, the sparkling wines. So I, I always like to kind of reinforce that there is this this knowledge base uh, and this whole holistic wine approach that you do touch on and bring to the conversation. But back yes. to champagne, um, how are things been, ha been going for the first half of the year? You, you obviously you touched on it a little bit about how um, it's been a, a, a lovely spring. Can you expand on that a little bit and I'm, you know, Somebody pointed out here already, and I was going to kind of bring it in as a surprise for you. Um, people really like your Instagram and Twitter feeds uh, because, <laughs> of, uh, because of what you post and it kind of keep us along here. So, um, you know, how has the spring been going on and, and what have been the challenges that you've had to adapt with, with not having yeah. the workforce and, and how, how are things happening in the vineyards during this period of time? Yeah. Yeah, it was, this uh, lockdown was very sudden. Sudden, unexpected, because I was in California end of, um, end of um, February and we came back early March and it was uh, like a panic. Uh, we had to stop everything or slow down and, and uh, the frontiers were locked down. Um, we use a lot, it, it's, we, we, we have some heavy work sometimes, like plantation, for example, new plantations, mm -hmm. where we use contractors. Contractors who come and help us because it's a very specific job. Uh, and we are very well organized like that. Uh, we supervise them and we control what they do. But what happened with the lockdown is that all those contractors say, oh, we close. We don't come. So we won't be there for for the most important moment uh, of, the, of the seller of uh, wine estate, which is plantation, the new plantation. And it happened that at the same time, we uh, had a lot of plantation to do this year because we are regeneratively managing our soils. It takes some time, we, have, uh, we are adapting things. And so we, 
we, we had a massive massal selection plantation organized for this year. And uh, so it was, a, it was very difficult at that moment. Fortunately, we asked all our company people uh, from marketing, from hospitality, from commercial sites we, that were locked down. We say, okay, we need people in the vineyard. So we managed to get uh, a lot of people from the company that had never been in the vineyards or never been a farmer. Uh, we managed to have them uh, in support. And um, in the end, I think they all enjoyed the exercise because they saw things they talk about, but they don't experience. So that's a, that was a unique way to uh, experience the vineyard work. And I, I had many of them saying, um, uh, telling me, now I will not drink the champagne the same way because I know the hard work that it requires. So I think people really uh, went back to the, to the products itself. And I think it was our soul that reun reunited us in such a difficult time to say, okay, what are we here for? We are here to make the best possible wine and to have the most beautiful vineyard. So let's go for that. And that will be our, the essence of our um, focus for uh, March, April, and this lasted until beginning of May. And, and in the end, it was a fantastic, all was done on um, timing. So that's also fantastic. So we achieved it. The productivity, to be honest, was not great. Um, the costs, they were a bit slow at some work because they were not vineyard people. So that was a little bit slower, but in the end we managed it very well. And, uh, and it was a unique, I, I, would, I should say, a unique team building, um, spiritual, exercise together facing, uh, facing that moment. So it's, I think we will remember that for a long time. It's the first time in 31 years, uh, I hope the last time uh, for some reasons, but uh, I, think, I think that's where, that's exactly the moment where you realize that when you are a family business, when you have values uh, of a family, people behave like a family. And that's what happened at Roderer. It was a family facing a difficult moment and, and, and really working together. That was a fantastic moment, fantastic moment. So you, you mentioned you had a lot of work in the vineyards. Obviously, it, it, it's great to hear that it takes this kind of team effort. Um, but to step back a second, you know, Rotor is always considered a large champagne house, but you have all this work that has to be done. And in the large champagne house, you typically aren't the ones controlling the vineyards, you're buying grapes. But Rotor is different from a lot of the other big houses. And, and, and what, sets, what sets you apart from those big houses? Uh, it's, that's one more time the vision of the founder that really was important at Rotor, which is we were first and foremost farmers. We wanted to own the land. Uh, very early, since the foundation of the, of the company, the family understood um, back in 1841 that if we wanted to control the quality of the wines and make the best possible effort, we needed to not only to make the wine, but we needed to press the grapes and we needed more to own the land and farm the land. Choose the special location with special identities to really create the wine, craft the wine that uh, is true to the, to the vision, the original vision of the family. So we have been buying since 1841, beautiful vineyards, some of the most beautiful plots of Champagne uh, in Grand Cru, mostly, uh, mid-slope, on pure choke, because there was this vision of choke that was key to the family, the finesse of choke. In Champagne, we have clay, we have sand, and we have choke. Grand Cru are choky mainly, and the choke is so special that in Champagne that it gives this 
graceful elegance to wine. You can have with a chalky soil, you can have a wine with lots of ripeness. So this is tasty, but also with lots of freshness. And you match the exact ideal champagne in our vision, which is this great freshness together with tasty ripeness. And this was the vision of the family. So they kept buying to the point that we are today making our vintage wines. So all our vintage wines, Cristal, of course, the Nature, the Blanc de Blanc, the Rosé, the Vintage, uh, they're all made from our own estate. So they are estate bottles. We are grower in those wines. The only wine which we don't have 100% estate bottled grapes is Brut Premier. Why? It's not because it's of a lesser quality. It's just because Brut Premier is our most important wine. It's our non-vintage, multi-vintage, you call it the way you want. But the idea of a multi-vintage is really to catch the region expression, not a village, not a plot, not a soil, but champagne. And to be able to uh, express the full champagne expression, you need to buy grapes from different locations that are a bit far away from our main chalky soils. So we go a little bit further on the Mount Valley, a little bit higher on the Montagne de Reims uh, to get these full pixels, I should say, full pixels of the champagne style and also to maintain from year to year consistent quality because champagne, as you know, the weather is difficult. It can be ripe. It can be very unripe. So the multi-vintage must maintain the style whatever the climate conditions. So you, the more you buy in different places, the more you can achieve this. So what sets Roderer different from other houses is that we are a big grower for all our vintage wines, but we are also a negotiant uh, for our non-vintage, multi-vintage wines. So this is this double head, double identity that makes us um, very special because we spend a lot of time in the vineyards and we also spend time in the cellar. So we, we have a level of what, what can I say? We, are, we, we try to be good on the two sides and to be maybe some of the best guys on the two sides. Another thing that distinguish ourselves from, um, from, from others is our addiction to nature. Uh, the family is <laughs> for a long time addicted to nature and um, we have uh, our current um, Add, we call it hand in hand with nature, which means uh, we try to be as close as possible to the soil more than to the cellar. Uh, we, we try to reflect a place, we try to reflect a vintage more than reflect a cellar know-how. So uh, this is very important for us to be very close to nature and um, to be very strongly um, uh, invested into the organic farming because we are the largest organic, organically farmed vineyards in Champagne by far. Uh, so we, are, we, we, have, we have some strong statements of uh, being uh, organic with certification that we are conversion to certification. This is what we are doing. And this is, this is, very, this is very unique. Uh, the wine and also a very beautiful uh, way of farming. So when did you begin the conversions to organic? And is there going to be a biodynamic phase uh, within the vineyards at uh, Rotor? We started, we started um, the organic conversion in 2000. So 20 years ago. Um, it, and I should say at the time it was not a conversion. It was the question we, we were asking at the time. Climate change was already very obvious in Champagne uh, since 89. We could see 
the climate warming, uh, the conditions changing. And we said, what should we do to make our soil, our ecosystem more resilient to this change that is coming? And one evident, obvious uh, uh, answer was, let's trust our soils, trust our vineyards, make our vine deep rooted and try a different way, a disruptive way of farming, forget herbicides, so we stopped her herbicides everywhere. And then we started to try organic, biodynamic, to see what would be the right, the right um, thing to do. Uh, don't forget it's a large scale because we are talking hundreds of hectares, so it's not a two hectare plot in the village. It's, lar it's, it's, it's a large size. So how can we do a conversion over the year to organic farming uh, on a large scale? That was a question. And we really worked on that for 12, 13 years, slowly changing our farming. And since 2018, we decided to enter into certification. So we first made sure we were able to do it. And that was changing the wines and bringing something new that we were wanting, we were, want, we were happy with. And then once we were mastering the new organic uh, farming, go on the conversion that we started in 18. Uh, Talking biodynamic, so in 2004, we got 10 hectares certified biodynamic Demeter. So we have 10 hectares biodynamic. To be honest, we use some biodynamic practice. I do biodynamic compost everywhere. I use a preparation 500, uh, 501 also. Uh, we, we use a lot of biodynamic tools in our, in our, in our practices. Um, we see biodynamic as a good way to fine tune your organic approach. If you, I will never say I will, I'm a biodynamist uh, because first I don't understand Steiner's uh, writings, but uh, there is a lot of very interesting thing into biodynamic. This wine, the Brut Nature, for example, Brut Nature uh, that we created in 06, this is 12, is 100% coming from biodynamic certified vineyards. Uh, this is our only biodynamic wines. Crystal is organic, uh, not certified yet, will be certified next, next year. Uh, Crystal, Crystal Rosé is organic. Um, Blanc de Blanc is organic as well. So, you know, we, we go step by step using many tools, biodynamic, organic. Most important is to be organic, certified. And then we go, uh, we, we, we try to, to use techniques that are really bringing something to the soil. And one more time, the idea is to have resilient soils, resilient vineyards, and most important, bring a different taste to the wines. So that kind of leads towards what were some of the first vineyards re you did? Was was Cumier one of the first plots that you started some of this experimentation with? Yes, so we started in Abyss, in Cumier, and in Verzenay, and in Aïe. But the largest vineyard was in, in Cumier, where we make uh, the Brut Nature. Yeah. And it was the first one where we, we went full speed. And in fact, this is why uh, in 2006, when we met Philippe Stark, who wanted us to make a natural wine because he was passionate about natural wines. And um, he loved champagne and we say, okay, we, we have this vineyard here, 10 hectares, it's biodynamic, Lee farmed. Let's work on this project and try to make something very close to the idea he wanted of a very pure, zero sugar, um, zero commercialist, uh, all uh, spontaneous yeast fermentation. So that's where all the story started. Um, so that's the first wine with Nature who, who was in fact 
um, organic and biodynamic. Farmed, oh. not certified, the wine. So as a chef de cave, and you talk about how important it is for the Brut Premier and the consistency and across the divinages, how challenging is that to change and shift gears to work and produce Brut Nature, which is the opposite concept of the non-vintage blend? Uh, this is easy now because champagne is changing. Champagne, and this is a good thing of climate change because there is a good, you know, champagne has long time been at the limit of climatic conditions to make, to ripen. You know, it was so hard to ripen that people developed multi-vintage to face this very difficult climate. But since climate change started, we have earlier on the earlier harvest, the fruit is riper, is cleaner as well because we have less rot. Botrytis for the last 15 years, I haven't seen botrytis much except in one year, but uh, so botrytis is less here and botrytis is a problem for champagne uh, when you want to age. Um, so I think we, 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 we are now and, and you can see that on the market, more and more grower wines coming, single vineyards, uh, more and more vintage. So I think Champagne is changing the, 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 the we, we were in a so difficult climate that we had to multi-vintage. And now we are in conditions of the farming with another farming, with the climate, where we can create, we can innovate, and we can really let the terroir speak, the parcel speak alone, the plot speak, uh, which was certainly very difficult in the 70s for our predecessors with the cool weather. And, we are, we are, and this is why Champagne is so exciting at the moment. This afternoon, I visited a, a, a grower, a friend grower who is uh, uh, famous, won't give you the name, but uh, and we, we were talking about that. We are talking about the beauty of Champagne today because you have this grower, small guy, uh, making very little wines, but beautiful wines, and then you have a house like Rodreur in Champagne for 250 years and making this type of wine like Brut Nature or making a single vineyard as well that we are making, uh, we are working on. So in fact, Champagne is very exciting at the moment. There is a, the weather, the, the, the condition, the generation of people is creating something very exciting, lot of different styles, lot of ideas. This is a place to, this is a very happy place to live at the moment. This is a very exciting place to live, to live in. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of the old generation now because they're all the young guys. And that's yeah, what you're, su you're such a young kid at heart. You can just tell, <laughs> wait, look, look at the enthusiasm right there. Um, yes, but I love visiting those young because the, the, the grower I saw today is, is in its 2013. So he's, he's in full energy. And right. I love that, you know, so I love visiting those guys to, to tell them, you are the f next, you're the next generation. Move it, do it. So, so you mentioned that uh, Philippe Stark came to you guys and wanted to do a, a champagne with you, um, and you and he wanted something natural. But why does the Cumier plot work to this to begin with? Not just because it was already biodynamics and it, yeah, and and and, and that's what maybe uh, exactly. Philippe wanted. Mm. You have a very strong rationale behind mm. brut nature. Yeah. And, and I believe that you rationalize Brut Nature different from a lot of your friends and colleagues, whether it's Vincent Laval, who's also in Cumier, or even what uh, your friends at Drapier are doing. Um, Brut Nature for you is different. And so can you expand on that a little bit and then kind of yes. dovetail that into the 2012 that you're, mm. you're sipping mm -hmm. on that I'm envious of at the moment? Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, when we, when we talked about the story of creating a zero dosage, so a complete different wines from our 
that was a kind of disruptive uh, movement for the house. And we, we are so proud of Crystal, as you know, which is a white soil choke story. And I wanted to create a new wine that would be the opposite. So I, I, I had to select a dark soil, not a white chalky soil, but a clay dark soil that will be the opposite. And as you know, in Champagne, I said, clay brings uh, roundness, fruit. Um, it's large on the palate, while uh, chalk is very, very lean, very precise, and needs a long time to express itself. So I wanted to have something, a terroir that would be completely different. So a, a white page to start with. Second, I wanted to have a soil that will be tasty, not a soil that will age forever, like it is for Cristal, but have a so an immediate pleasure, an immediate fulfillment of ex expressive flavors and so on. So I selected those dark uh, clay of Cumier uh, that are very, very special, very unique in this area uh, of Champagne. And most important, at the same time, I wanted to do a field blend. I didn't want to have, like we do usually, Pinot Noir picked one day, Chardonnay picked the other day, and Meunier another day, and then blend them during the winter. I wanted to be completely true to the place. So uh, the only way to be true to this special location was to field blend them. So we were picking, we, we decided to pick them the same day. We pick Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Meunier, we bring everything on the press, and this is it. This is done. We won't reblend it over the winter. It is what it, the way it comes from the vineyards. To be honest, there is also a technical reason behind that, is that I wanted to work on low sulfur, which is a very new way of working in Champagne. And Meunier and Pinot Noir are a little bit difficult to work with very low sulfur because they are oxidative. They, if you work them with low sulfur, they can be very, very quickly oxidized and you lose. It doesn't get completely oxidized, but you lose a little bit of the pristine fruit that Meunier and Pinot Noir can have. So Chardonnay is, on the contrary, very reductive. So by field blending them, the reductive power of Chardonnay helps the Pinot Noir not to oxidize. And I can work it without sulfur. So because I have this film blend with some strong percentage of Chardonnay, I can manage not to use sulfur at harvest time. And that was also the idea. I talked about natural wine. The idea was to be low sulfur. I don't say zero sulfur because it's not it's not the, it was not the idea, the, the, the goal, but use as little sulfur as possible and definitely not sulfur at harvest time. And that was, that was, that, that was the decision. And I like what you say. I think we make it, be, in the end, it is a very different brut nature because to many people, when they taste them for the first time, they don't realize it's a brut nature. And that's maybe my, mo my most beautiful compliment. Uh, when people say, ah, there is zero dosage, but I don't feel it. This is sweet. This is round. This is fruity. And I love this because this is what we wanted to do. It's a wine that, in fact, doesn't need any sugar because it's naturally sweet because of the clay, because of the ripeness, and because of this way to work without sulfur and so on. So this is a wine design to, that doesn't need, in fact, doesn't need any, 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 any dosage. Is this also a learning tool, an experiment for you in the future of, of Rotor in dealing with climate change and trying to find how to balance and, and achieve great acidity 
uh, yep. in the wine because isn't acidity like the key backbone component of a champagne? Yes, I, I, I called it, I, I, I don't say acidity, I say freshness. So I, I called, it, I called the, the making of this wine at one, day, at one point, I called it fighting for freshness. In fact, it was to reinvent freshness uh, in this, in a hot year. So I see how we can rely on uh, this fresh power of the, of the soil in a very sunny year. Uh, because I say freshness because freshness is much more than acidity. Acidity is part of freshness, of course. But freshness is the saltiness, is the texture as well, is where uh, the definition of the wine gives you a fresh wine. Um, so it's a light wine as well. It's not an acid wine. Acidity for me is one is important, but it's not, if it's too acid, it's lean. And in fact, in the end, you, you miss something. It's not tasty at all. So uh, I want to find this amazing balance. And this is a, like you said, this is a really a, a, a trial because we work with zero, no sugar. Uh, we work with low pressure because it's lower pressures than in our other bottlings. We work with um, no blending uh, magic. So it comes from field blend. <laughs> so it has, to be, it has to be really good from, from start, you know, because you have no makeup. You cannot, if it's, if it's wrong, it's wrong. So it's, it's, a way, uh, it's a way to put our team in danger. That's what I wanted. I wanted our team to be put in danger, because I think we are only good when we are in danger. When we are in, very, in, in mastering what we do, it's good, but at one point it's not enough. So we need to be, this is our dangerous wine. <laughs> well, I've been a fan of it since you first released the 06. Um, 2012 is a unique vintage. I know you're, 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 you're sipping on the regular Brut Nature. Tell us a little bit about the uniqueness of 2012. And then, you know, let's not forget mm. um, the, the other half that you introduced in 2012, because you now make a rosé yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, 12 is unique because 12, I think for me, it's a very important year in our story of conversion to organic biodynamic because I was talking about risk. That was a scary year. We really, uh, we lost some vineyards, some, we lost some fruit because we, the, f the fight against downy mildew was so hard that we, 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 we needed to be very good. And this was, it was a super, I think my most difficult vintage ever. Uh, we really suffered because until mid-July, we had some rainfalls, we had some storms, and the vineyards were still getting mildew and mildew, and it never stopped, and we were organic. So that was, that was very difficult. And in the end, uh, the magic happened. The magic of a uh, superb August, uh, fantastic September, Low crop, because we had lost so many uh, berries by the mildew, but they were removed. Uh, so we had a low crop, especially in Pinot Noir, that gives a sublime texture. The fruit was really, really delicious, which is, if, I'm, I'm sure you know, in Champagne at harvest time, it's not always delicious. It's sometimes a bit acidic. That was super delicious. It was, it was like uh, uh, eating, eating a candy, you know, that was so beautiful, so soft, so softly textured that we said we must do something special that year. And we created the Brut Nature Rosé. So I picked a few, five days before harvest, I went through the vineyards, I, pe I picked a few hundred kilos of the most beautiful grapes with good, these beautiful candy flavors. So we tested the grapes, cut the, the cluster, the bunch, 
selected them and we macerated them over five days, during five days in cool temperature, so that the skin really is a color. And when we picked the estate, I added this and created the rosé uh, nature. And this rosé nature is magic of, its, of this lightness of texture. It's a, it's a beautiful expression of the unique expression of, of 2012 Pinot Noir. Uh, an amazing year. I say it's a turning point because we have seen that in the following years, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 19. This is a golden decade we are having for Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is superb. Over the last seven, eight years, we are making super Pinot Noir, which gives us some other ideas, by the way, to make. <laughs> Coteau Champenois, uh, Pinot Noir as well. Oh, okay. Oh. Well, I think it's also important to, to step back a second. On the Brut Nature, you've only produced how many vintages since the launch of the 06? This is a third vintage. We made six, uh, nine, mm -hmm. and 12. And the next one will be 15. And there is an 18. Every three years, not because we meant to do, we wanted to do it, but it's just that moment, that, those special years or years where the ripeness was, it was a, that, that was sunny year, dry years, and the ripeness of all the grape varieties came together. That's why we, we do field blend. In 19, for example, I, I, was, I was sure it would be a, a brute nature year, and uh, but but the Meunier ripe, ripened faster, so I couldn't feel blend them. So there won't be any uh, Brut Nature 19 because of this. I don't know what happened in 19, but the Meunier was a sprinter and Pinot Noir and Chardonnay stayed behind. Um. With, with that, when you were first introducing the Brut Nature, you were thinking that it was a wine to be consumed in the short term. But you and I have had some conversations privately where you've been surprised at how Brut Nature has been aging in the bottle. Yeah, yeah, it was a complete, um, it was, as I, say, I said, this is our danger wine, dangerous wine. And one of the danger was what, how this wine could age without sugar, because we know that sugar acts as an antioxidant preser preser preserves the wines against oxidation. So no sugar is a wine more uh, at risk. But this is also part of the story. We want it to be at risk. That's why I said first, I said, let's drink it because I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea of how it will age. And now we know a little bit because we have had six, we have had, we have had nine. And we see that it's, I would say that my experience now is that yes, it ages faster. Yes, it does age faster than regular dosage wines. Is it because of the sugar? I don't know. Is it because of a clay soil? Maybe because we know that clay soil have higher pH, and higher pH means less oxidative strengths. So the wines are a little bit higher pH. Uh, they don't have the sugar to protect them. So uh, it, they are moving faster. But do they oxidize? I'm not sure they oxidize. I think they, they, they mature. I will, I will say it's more a mature, uh, an earlier, faster maturity than an oxidation process. But, but one more time, we have to learn. An important precision is that we, made, we make this wine only in perfect years, no botrytis. The fruit is perfect. So there is nothing in the raw material that will go towards oxidation. So we take care of this. This is why I can't do it every year. 
if I have a year with botrytis, I would never do brut nature because I'm, I'm sure that will age fast. We're almost at an hour and we haven't even touched on Cristal. So crazy. this is crazy. <laughs> This is because um, of the questions. Too many questions, I tell you. Hey, what? People are asking questions. I'm curious. You know me. I always have questions. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about Cristal. And, and obviously, there's been a few people, you know, curious about your opinions of the 2008 vintage. Um, you've, you've touched on that 2012 was an important vintage for Cristal as well. Um, and we were talking before everybody else got on. Um, how the 08 is in versus the 12 is drinking. So why don't you take us into Cristal a little bit and, and, tell, and touch on both the 08 and the 12 vintage. Yes, Cristal. So as you know, Cristal is a chalky soil. All vines, all vines more than 25 years old. So they are deep rooted. The average age of the vineyards of Cristal in the bottle is about a bit less than 50 years old. So um, there's lots of deep rooted vines, which get the water on the bedrock of chalk. Um, this is where we have the purest, fantastic water in Champagne. And as you know, there is a lot of water in wine. There is 85% of water. So, so it, comes from, it comes from this soil, you know, this beautiful soil. So there is this l luminous brightness of crystal that is key to, to, to the wine. But the age of the vines can, can give also uh, the ripeness, the body, the low yielding and concentration that is important to balance, to balance this type of soil because this is a very, very fresh soil and you need to give some, 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 some roundness and ripeness on it. So we take crystal from the same plots every year, roughly, more or less. Uh, so this is the same estate, uh, seven Grand Cru, um, uh, mid-slope, old vines, as I said. And the only difference is the climate of the year. And 08 is definitely a cool year uh, with, um, with a very, very slow, slow ripening process. So this is a very elegant. And in the cool year like that, we know that sunshine is less present into the wines and the soil. Soil takes the position. So this is a soil, chalky soil wine with lots of precision, lots of fuselage, finesse, um, a wine to age forever, I guess. And another good thing for 08 is that, as all, I, I always say, if 08 is not such a great year as a vintage, but the great thing about 08 is that all the winemakers who made, Chef de Cave, who made the 08 in Champagne, were in charge more or less in 96 as well. And in 96, we've done mistakes. We picked too early. We processed the wines not enough on ease. We, we, we care more, we, in 96, we cared more about the acidity than about the wine. So when, when 08 came, we had the unique chance to replay the game and get it right this time. So I think we got it right 08 because of we made 96 before. That's why it's better than 96. And that's why it's almost as good as 88. So I think it will end up with 88 as two of the beautiful vintages uh, of the last 30, 40 years. So this is, but this is a wine that needs time, definitely needs time. 12 is, I talked about the texture of Pinot Noir. So the Pinot Noir was really textured, really tasty, very beautifully, beautifully um, balanced. And you can feel it in 12. And I think 12 today uh, has more of this deliver, more of this tasty, uh, beautifully um, balanced uh, structure. Uh, it's yet very chalky behind. That is why it's very well balanced between sunshine and soil. Uh, but I think it's 
it's to me a bit more complete than the 08 was. Uh, having said that, I know how lucky I am. This is two of the most beautiful champagnes ever made. So saying I prefer 12 or 8 uh, is like, um, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, you cannot say which one is the most beautiful but because they are two absolutely beautiful wines. Um, yeah, I would bet a little bit more on 12 in the long term. I don't know why. Uh, maybe it's because of my story about 12 vintage, because it was so hard. We suffered so much that it's such a reward for the farmer we are to have achieved what we have achieved in 12. And also, this is the first year, 12, where we achieved to be 100% uh, free of synthetic chemi chemistry. So there is... Uh, it's all, it's not certified organic but and biodynamic but it was it was found this way it definitely has a a little bit more generous texture to it right now um mm. quite floral quite perfume where the 08 has that really tight bore of yeah. of well you you'll call it freshness not acidity right but it it's yeah. it's very tightly wound um but i think it, the unique piece here is you've you talked about Pinot Noir a good bit, and a common misconception is that Cristal is Chardonnay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But yeah. how 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 much Pinot is in the typical blend of Cristal, and and how important is the Pinot to the character of Cristal? There there is on the classic Cristal there is sixty percent Pinot Noir, and forty percent Chardonnay. Uh, so it's more Pinot Noir than Chardonnay. But this is Pinot Noir and Choc. Usually on Choc, Pinot Noir struggles and usually people plant Chardonnay and Choc. Uh, even in Verzi, Verzonnay, which are Pinot Noir countries, the growers put Chardonnay onto these Chocky soils. At Rodreur, we put Pinot Noir there. So this is a Pinot Noir that tests in between Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. This is it tastes choke, in fact, and that's the magic of this, of this, uh, of, the, of this, uh, of Cristal. I think it's to have this Pinot Noir on choke, which is very rare, and also to have a ripe Pinot Noir on choke. That, 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 that's very important. And Pinot Noir, so if you look at Chardonnay Pinot Noir dimensions, in Cristal, we don't do malolactic fermentation or very little malolactic fermentation. So this is the, the acidity that comes from the vineyards. And when you have non-malolactic wines, they are leaner, more uh, fresher, of course. They don't have the same roundness. You don't have the lactic acid to wrap the texture on the mouth. So you can only rely on one of the grape variety to give you the texture. So texture in crystal doesn't come from malolactic, but it comes from Pinot Noir. So we need the Pinot Noir in Cristal. This is very important to bring this flesh that is difficult to catch on choke without malolactic fermentation. Um, why we don't do malolactic fermentation? So that's not my choice. It's just because it's the way we used to make champagne before the 60s. All champagne before the 60s had no malolactic because we didn't know what it was. So um, that's why most of the people were fermenting in oak at that time because the oak was bringing the sweetness uh, of non-malolactic wines. Uh, the, the decision of the family back in the 60s was to stick to this style of original champagne without malolactic, with some oak fermentation, but with a lot of ripeness of fruit. So this is, this, is, this is a choice of the parti pris, the decision, the stylistic vision we have in Cristal, which, which in fact give uh, this direction to the cuvee. Um, so we get the texture from Pinot Noir, and Pinot Noir is very important into, into, into Cristal. But you've had one small little change that you've implemented on Cristal um, from the traditional Cristal from the 60s or, or 70s, and that's the dosage. Uh, 
what have you done there and, and why have you made those changes? Oh, we, we have decreased the dosage. That's what you mean? That's a decrease of dosage? You mean, yep. yeah, we decreased the dosage because it's, it's, it's not because we wanted to have a low dosage wine. I think the do there is only one dosage. It's the dosage of the balance you want for the wine. So it's not a question of sugar. It's a question of what level of energy, of comfort, or uh, of backbone you want to, to, to give to your wine. So we, we, that's a decision we took a few, one more time climate change uh, answer that we had to decrease the dosage to reach a level of more freshness and on balance. And, and in fact, what we have changed is that we have adapted the dosage to the wine. Uh, a wine needs a certain amount of sugar or not. But um, so if we are on a warmer climate, it needs less sugar. Uh, but let's not be uh, misled. Because recently I tested in 1929 uh, wine of the house. And it was not a crystal, it was a vintage 1929. And we tested with the team and we say, okay, what's the dosage? And we, look, we all look at each other and say, oh, at that time they were using sugar, of course. So that must be fairly high dosage, about 13 grams, 14 grams. So we went in the machine to see what was the sugar level. It was seven grams. So I think back even in the early 1900s or late 1800s, they, they were adapting, you know, they were adapting to, re, to the market because some markets like sweet wines, some markets prefer dry wines. So they were also adapting to their taste and, and to the vintage because the vintage was on 1929, as you know, 28, 29 or two magic ripe vintages. So ripe vintage, low dosage. 100 years ago. So <laughs> not invented wait, wait, anything. Wait, you, ha you, you have 29 Vinotech is, is what you're saying? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but just for me. <laughs> um, how, uh, 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 to touch on it real quickly, um, how has this Vinotech program helped you understand making Cristal for the future? The Vinotech program is an interesting program. I think it, Champagne, uh, the champagne in general has two, there is a vineyard, we talked about the vineyard. There is a, the wine, the initial winemaking that is one part, but there is a long part of champagne that is aging on these. This is unique to champagne because that's, and this is a full universe by itself. Um, more time on lees, less time on lees, uh, bottle kept sur lat, flat, or riddled down with the lees on the neck. Uh, all those type of aging uh, have an influence into the wine. So in fact, we keep making the wines into the bottle for a long time. So the Vinotech program is a tribute to that side of champagnes. We, we have done a lot of work in the, cellar, in the vineyards, going back to what uh, more organic and so on, more yeah, on the fruit. But I think we, need, we needed also to focus on this very special type of aging on leaves with different level of leaves, uh, yeast, not the same, different pressure. Uh, there is a full world of creativity that exists uh, into, into this uh, aging. So the Vinotech program is designed to elaborate, showcase this um, dark, deep, dark world of the cellar where the wines um, take another direction. They are the same wine at the beginning, the original disgorgement and the Vinotech, but they are completely different now because one has taken the decision of the light, the original, and the other one of the dark. And so this is, I think we know yet very little of this, but there is some never ending creativity 
into this uh, world and we are working on that. Even we are working on the place where we store the bottles because if you store the bottle in a cool, choky cellar or in a not as cool cement or stony cellar, you don't have the same wines. You know, it's a little bit like in Jura, you know, you have different cellar, different floor, different taste. They're not the same voile, you don't age the same way. And this is about to happen in our, in our cellars as well. It's, a, it's an ecosystem, in fact. Each cellar is an ecosystem where the wines can go in another direction. So that's, that's what the Vinotech program uh, is I initiated back in 95. And it takes a lot of time because we release them after 20 years and 25 years. Uh, this is what the Vinotech program is meant to, you know, in, in, in Burgundy, for example, more and more people are aging some wines, not anymore in oak barrel, but in glass barrels, you know, like Arnaud Hunt, for example, in Burgundy. In fact, that's what we are doing. <laughs> we are in sealed glass bottles on aging for a long term as well. So there is a world of aging in the glass that is very interesting. Glass is a very neutral, neutral world as well. Um, and we can do things. We can, we can, yeah, we can, we can show some new, we, <laughs> we can find some new ways, some new, yeah. Yeah, it's a very it's a fantastic place. Fantastic ideas. Trying many, many things, but it will take a long time to learn. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. I've tried to cover as all the, all the questions that came in. Uh, I thank everyone for coming out and joining us. Uh, I hope everyone stays happy, safe, well. Um, yeah. And, you know, we look forward to, uh, you know, trying to get to Champagne and enjoy these be beautiful sites like this uh, with the beautiful weather that you're having in Champagne. But uh, until then, um, We'll have to, you know, enjoy our Brut Nature and our Cristal or Brut Premier or whatever it might be. But uh, thank you so much for your time, John Batiste, and everyone for joining us. I greatly appreciate it. And I hope everyone is happy, healthy, and stays well um, and has a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Jeremy, and be well. And um, the world is experiencing difficult time at the moment. And... Uh, Let's not forget to enjoy people, friendship around a good bottle of wine. And this is, uh, this is important. Wine is civilization, as we say. So let's be civilized. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. It's been, uh, <laughs> it's, been, it's been great to see you. And, you know, hopefully we'll catch up again soon. And I hope everyone, um, once again, you know, your, your friends, family, stay healthy, safe. And uh, you know, hopefully, we'll get, we'll get through this and have a have a wonderful uh, second half to 2020. I keep the bottle for the next meeting. <laughs> no, you, you know me. I want the 77. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Bad vintage, but <laughs> we'll do it. It drinks well. What can I say? <laughs> Take care. Good to Take see care. you. Thank bye you, everybody. Bye. Ciao, bye ciao. Bye.